let's get right into it, Roger. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, of course, no one will be able to ask questions unless uh, they get to know more about Peter. And um, without sounding as if we are having an interview, Peter, tell us something about yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Roger. Thank you so much, Viola. Um, glad to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me and uh, really just hosting me here. Um, Peter Kakoma, um, uh, the professional role I currently hold is I am the CEO and founder of Kanzu Code uh, Limited. And since we're talking generally development, before I was holding this role, I also held the role as a senior technical consultant at a company called Andela, Uganda, um, as part of the very first few hires when it was setting up in, uh, in country and uh, part of really that, that startup process for it. I also held a role, a, good, a number of roles at MTN Uganda over the years, a period of about eight or so years. By the time I left, I was a principal engineer in what's called the value added services section, which is really everything that doesn't concern voice. Uh, so handled USSD, SMS, and also the section that was building custom applications. Uh, I'm also a writer. I used to write with the Sunday Monitor. I'm also a church leader. Uh, yeah, I lead a fellowship. I'm also an elder in a church called Worship Harvest. And um, I'm also a father and a husband, father of two oh. amazing young girls. Yeah. Interesting. S since we're having a very big list of uh, most of the people here, developers, they've heard you say, okay, now you're one of the people who began Andela. Tell us, how was that experience like uh, starting up with Andela? What, what really happened? And a good story, juicy story would, would be thrown in here. People would love to hear what, what they've never heard anywhere before. <laughs> No, I, I wouldn't say, I, I, as, as one of the first hires, really, um, we, were, we were four four senior engineers that were brought on and were part of helping in, in uh, the process of recruiting now the rest of the team. Um, well, I, I, I can't see how different it could be with Tonga, but I, I, I know that it was a wonderful experience in so many ways. Uh, at the time, because the local office wasn't yet fully set up, we did our onboarding in Kenya. Uh, maybe that serves as a, a juicy story. Juicy so, story. Uh, yeah. Some, to some people didn't have passports until Andela, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, started from the bottom. Yeah, okay. so yeah, we were there for about a month and uh, before we eventually came back and the office here was gradually set up. Um, it was Boss. a very tiny office then, uh, but then it started to expand as the team grew. Interesting. Oh, um, right. Every day, like I learned something new about Peter. Um, he's a jack of all trades and a master of all. I can't say a master of none. <laughs> true, true, true. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, however, I wanted to I wanted to know more about um, his work in MTN because MTN is, of course, everyone, everyone knows MTN as a telecom company, more into telecoms. If not, then it's mobile money yeah you mentioned things like you used to work um ussd uh, customer applications can you please expound on that uh, what exactly you were uh, putting your hands on in regards to uh, in mtn okay so in terms of formal training i'm trained as an electrical engineer so i initially joined mtn oh. in, in, as a telecom engineer so to speak but I loved programming, so I, I would build tools to make my work a bit more efficient. So when a role showed up in a section that was writing code, I had stuff to show and say, you guys, I can actually do this thing. So I moved into a custom software development role, and, and that's what I was doing. And over time, um, I then moved into a role where I was leading the team that was doing the custom in-house development. So the way MTN worked back then um, is that you had some applications that were built in-house and then you had some 
that are, are outsourced to an IT department. And then you also had aspects that take care of uh, services like USSD. So in the network, there's, the U, there's a USSD server, let me call it that. And there's a team that has to make sure it's up and running, check the logs, uh, the uptime, even the SMS server, do that for that as well. So uh, as leading those, those three teams, the value added services uh, section, the value added services applications, which is a custom software development team, mm -hmm. and also one that was doing a bit of customer support um, yeah, around so those two services. Well, cool, thanks a lot. Yeah, Lean, USSD is that uh, hash one, two, five eh? style. Don't, don't get confused there. Eh? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Those are the USSD ones. <laughs> Internet has taken over so much so that some people don't know what this is. For people concept. forgot what this is. <laughs> uh, which or at least I, I, I like the fact that we have something in common coming from a telecom background to uh, software development. That is very interesting. Uh, before I start bragging, I would love, I would love to hand over something to, to, to Viola to continue from here. No, Roger gets excited at any opportunity for a bromance, <laughs> but good that he called himself so um before we get into um your experience with andela um just give us an overview of what kanzu code is and what you do with kanzu code yes you told us you're the ceo but what are the details okay thank you thank you so much so kanzu code builds tools uh digital tools for businesses and communities um around the world Primarily for the for our space here, we have a core banking platform for uh, savings and credit organizations, typical circles, investment clubs, and microfinance institutions. So we help them digitize and make their process of uh, managing their financial portfolios much easier. Outside here, we build uh, custom tools for businesses around the world. Uh, and we've, we've somehow found a bit of a footing in uh, particularly a, a, a segment in the US where we've had a bit of success serving a number of clients and uh, so that we, we have both those arms, the custom software development and then also our product for the local market. Um, it's, it's actually interesting when you, men you mention all over the world, right? Ideally, Tunga is trying to work with people all over the world. You have worked locally. Um, and I've, I've noticed differences. People think working for a local client is different from working for an international client. How do you manage to um, do that? Do you have the same consistency, the same billing? How do you do that? Yeah. That's a, that, that is, and it, it's one of those things we, we learned as we went along. Uh, I mean, looking back now, it might seem a bit obvious for uh, some of you, but back then it, it's something that uh, we figured out going in. Uh, and again, for me, my, my background is, is really software engineering. So stepping into business and entrepreneurship um, there's also the process of learning that there are, there are other skills outside writing code that you need to develop really quickly as you run a business. So all that said, um, the local clientele, we, we realized that uh, there were a number of things that we needed to, to take into account. One is we needed to profile which kind of local clients we serve because we, we learned really quickly that for example, our price point wasn't going to be appreciated by uh, every single local client. So also another thing we learned is there were certain kinds of local clients who couldn't differentiate between, uh, I mean, work produced by a junior engineer and a senior engineer. And so if you're giving a senior engineering bill, <laughs> There's no, as far as the client is concerned, they just want a thing that works. You can't start bringing in things of value, what? It's a different ball game. It, 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 if it's a car, it's a car. You're not saying this is an, no offense to anyone, the difference between an Ipsum and a Benz is actually different. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to use a relatable example. I'm not trying to Look, throw shit. <laughs> Look at me get offended. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no one should catch feelings. Okay, so Japanese we found, we, 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 we learned that um, 
yeah, that there was a difference and it was a bit hard to communicate that difference in value uh, to certain kinds of clients. So we started to see how to, how to differentiate who we serve. We also went through what I'll call the RFP dance, where you uh, are the big RFP out and you apply and you expect to be picked because you've actually built some really good work under your belt and uh, then you hear crickets um <laughs> so that's a good so one. that aspect with working with local clients as well that there's an yeah. RFP process and it ha at least up till now in our experience it hasn't been very clear about how that works and how you actually get selected in, in some of them. I'm not saying all, I'm just saying some. Uh, the third aspect with working with local clients was also around uh, the payment cycles. It, it typically took a bit longer to get paid. And if you're running a business and you have, uh, I mean, bills to pay, it becomes really tricky with some of the payment cycles you run in. So, uh. Yeah, those, those are some of the experiences, which is what led us to focus a lot more on having a product for the local mm -hmm. space and uh, scaling that. You're still offering value, but you're putting it at a price point that's within reach and you can scale and reach more and still have the impact you want to have. Because as a business, one of the things I wanted to do is also have an impact on the yeah. continent directly. Um, but the way we were going about it before it just wasn't working on so many levels. Um, so that that's the sweet spot we found uh, so far. And and this is how many years later. <laughs> <laughs> now I wish, it was, I wish it was like those startup stories we see on on, on TV, <laughs> where TV, in, a, so in in a year and in oh, in six months you figured things out. Well, as it took it took us a while. We are we are now seven years old as a company. Yeah. Um, so All right. in, that's in that sense. In that sense, there's been a bit of slow learning. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I was saying that seven years um, is quite a big time. And of course, for you, seven years with a company, it means uh, more years in the field. For example, I'm, I'm looking at around 12 years, um, which means you've been around for some time uh, in the tech industry. Uh, how would you, uh, how would you uh, say that the industry has changed or evolved since uh, 12 years back, I know we have we have we have seen very many things come in. By the time maybe you began, there was no iPhone. How do you think it has evolved? Ah, I need to out Roger that he hates iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, throwing that much shade, Roger. I, I, <laughs> I, I didn't start that long ago, <laughs> before the iPhone, really. Oh, okay, that's 2007. No, <laughs> so a lot, a lot has changed. A lot has changed. Um, for one, I'll start with one that is a really, well, there are so many exciting trends, but one that everyone on this call can relate with that you're working for Tunga. Like that's, that's, that's massive. The, the, such, these things were unheard of back then. I'll, 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 the African developer, the African engineer didn't have that kind of appreciation globally. Like you didn't exist. If, if anyway, yeah, that's one of the really, really biggest ones that are, it's, it's really exciting that in this day and age, you can live in Charlie Wajala, uh, or, I don't know, and you're working for a company uh, in Europe and delivering value and getting paid for that. Like that was unheard of. The, your opportunities were restricted to writing PHP and nothing against writing PHP scripts. Uh, I, 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 I still write those. I still write those. No, no, no. <laughs> PHP is still a language I use very frequently. I'm just bringing it from the perspective of where I lately. Yes, like back then, when you are working back then, mm. I mean, you are going to be writing PHP scripts. Like that's what yes. I was doing. Correct. And that's all you are going Correct. to be doing. And you're going to mm -hmm. build a website for a guy, you build him a 300K, it takes forever to pay you. Like that was your life, that, that was it. And today, yeah, for, man. For, for, context, for context, we have Nigerian people following us. 
300k yeah. means 300,000 Ugandan shillings. So. Oh, which uh, is about <laughs> roughly a hundred dollars. <laughs> which is about a hundred. Remove a zero and it's naira. Yeah. Three thousand naira. Three thirty thousand naira, I think, or something close to that. Yes, yes, yes. So um, thank you, thank you so much for for bringing that in context. Like that was all the opportunity you had back then, but right now you have a whole world of opportunity, um, with with things like this. Beyond that, there are also a lot of other things. You you didn't have opportunity. You, your opportunities for growing a startup are very limited. If you are going to look for funding, for example, I mean, you, you couldn't dream of pitching. I mean, where are you going to get those opportunities? But today you have a lot of that happening, a lot of um, interest in the continent. You have all the major players globally, all the major global tech players have set up shop in Africa. Our internet speeds have increased. Man, we are doing two uh, gigabytes. Like that was the ghetto, <laughs> the real ghetto. So you might even not know what two G is. <laughs> it was tough. <laughs> yeah, All I right, mean, yes, uh, it was tough. Um, I could I could go on and on and on. Like things were things were bad. Mm -hmm. Things can still get better now. There are still things that uh, they still advocacy about. Uh, I mean bringing our, inter our costs, our internet costs further down, removing yeah. um, barriers to entry. There are still a lot of things that can improve. Um, but sure. yeah, none of those things were available back then, and which all, all of which are a possibility today. Um, I, I could really go on and right. on. It's one of those uh, things but, I'm, I'm quite excited but about. But I, I, I remember there used to be yeah, I remember there used, there used to be those pitching sessions way back. Of course, there's one that used to be in Nairobi. I forget the name. It was really, really uh, Pivot East. Pivot East, correct. Uh, did you participate yeah. in Pivot East? Don't judge me how old I am. But... <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you see, the, the fact that you have, you, ha you, have, you can even remember a name. The name and the yeah, fact that you had to, to go across the border to pitch. Yeah. yeah. Is already saying old. a lot. Yeah. Today, sure. I mean, everyone on this, just last week, uh, Google had a pitching thing online for black ventures. And to pitch, all you needed to do was go to a Google form and submit some stuff and also be uh, black. Yeah. I thought it was be black. Yeah. Yes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I didn't take part in pitch first. So when I started out, Kanzu Koda was still working full time at uh, MTN. Cool. So were entirely bootstrapping and not not looking for investment and it was a thing that was growing organically outside the work i was doing for for mtn it's, it's interesting that you mentioned uh because you have had quite the the shiny career you did electrical engineering you joined mtn which was global you got into the software development train when it was starting and I mean, you are part of the Andela Senior Consultants. Yet amidst all these, you decided to venture out and, and, and start your own thing. So how does that then happen? So when I, was, when, when, when I got really animated about how there was a lack of opportunity back then, <clears throat> there were two things that was standing out for me. One, as I worked in the, tele, in the telco, in MTN, I realized really quickly that almost all the software we're purchasing, were buying it from external service providers. Right. So for me, I was like, you guy, this means, I mean, Dime is leaving the economy. We have people here who can actually do these jobs. Yeah, it just didn't sit right. Um, so that was one of the reasons, finding a way to showcase globally that we can actually produce solid, solid software on the continent. And then the other thing was that we, are, we were a very small team, like we're building a uh, software serving a really huge uh, customer base. Uh, at that time, it was about 10 million or so customers. And we're a tiny team, we're about three, three people uh, doing that software. And I was like, you know what? this. This software thing is one you get better at by doing. Like the bigger the problems you're exposed to, the better you get at it. And here we are, and you're just three people, yet there are so many people out there who could learn and grow and benefit from this thing. But here we are just three people, and, and that team isn't going to grow anytime soon. 
given the first bit that I mentioned. So I, I, I felt I, I need to do something about this. So uh, the stepping out was to try and address those two things. One, showcase globally that we can actually create solid software on the continent. And then two, speak uh, directly into that gap, create opportunities for people to actually grow in the field of software. Cool. Um, uh you, you, you spoke about opportunities, and of course, most of the, most of the developers we have here at, um, at Tunga uh, will not, their world won't start and end with Tunga. Of course, there will be opportunities for them past, this, uh, past, past Tunga. So uh, how, how do you think uh, developers on the African continent should be able to position themselves as, uh, on, the global, on the global demand? Uh, what is your view uh, about that? Uh, that's, that's another really good question. The, the beauty about global demand right now, <clears throat> by and large, is focused entirely on your skill. Like, can you actually do this stuff? And given, give, give, while there were even certain aspects that were, slow, that were not moving as fast as they could have in that direction, with COVID, like that thing has been accelerated. Like companies everywhere are now hi hiring globally. So it's, can you actually do this stuff? So I would say to position yourself globally, there are two key things. One, have some solid projects under your belt. The good thing is you're working with a company that's already putting you in places, in spaces, uh, exposing you to projects that are actually um, uh, giving you the experience that really looks good. Um, it, 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 I mean, the experience, again, as, as exposed to back then, if I've been building um, just one, two, three WordPress sites for 10 years, is not the same as someone who's built a, a full, who's worked on uh, a tool for, I don't know, one of the companies you're working for, and you've done a certain component in okay. there, and you've done some heavy lifting in that component. So one, have the projects, be intentional about, um, getting the projects and where, where that, it's very unlikely for people like you, but if there are things you feel that you could grow in, there's a lot of open source software you can contribute to. Um, find one and build a, a project code base in, in a particular aspect. And then two, then go after mastery. Like interview processes these days are not the kind that you can, well, it might have been easier back then, but it's not the kind you're going to waltz in. So get 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 into mastery. Um, so get your algorithms and data structures down. Put in the time. Put in the time. When you, it's going to show in the interview process when if if you have not actually cracked that stuff. It's one good thing to know the it's language and know how trash. it works. So get that get that in as you build the project. But now as you start to prepare for interviews, then get that other aspect in, because that's what the interviews typically look for. Those would be the two things I would, I would uh, focus a lot on, the projects and then getting the skills for the technical interview process, the way it's set up today. So I, I actually, I, I think maybe you have a different experience. I also like to believe that soft skills have gotten yeah. higher yes. in demand. Yes, well, yes, if you, could speak, if you could speak to it as well. No, thank you. Thank you so much. That, that, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll even step back and speak as an employer, someone who's employed quite a number of people <laughs> now, yeah. and also who's led on a number of teams, both here and even like while working with Andela, working with distributed teams. Thank you so much for pointing that out. That thing can't be overemphasized. It doesn't matter how much you are a rock star. I'm telling you, they'll let you go if you're the kind who doesn't. <laughs> You go offline and don't respond. You are supposed to deliver something in a certain time. It doesn't come through. Uh, I mean, if you're stuck, reach out and say you're stuck. But in the remote world we are living in, it's not like the office space where you had uh, visual cues to get a sense of someone is going through some stuff, what, what, what. Man, today we are relying on, on, on what you've sent via email, via Slack, via whatever tool you're using. So if you're not honed in on those soft skills and being open and candid about what's happening and uh, 
being a team player, like that's how you become in this, uh, you become valuable. You're the person people reach out to and you actually they are helping and actually sharing knowledge. You generally just become more valuable on a team when you're a proper well-rounded person. You're, just, you're not, um, unfortunately, we're usually showcased as uh, loners in movies and somehow that's the identity we seem to want to adopt as developers. Even the yeah. social ones somehow see, I mean, those things of one people's stars, those things don't work anymore. They have, they worked for the people who built WhatsApp, the two people, but man, <laughs> that mode. That's, that's what the movies show. Exactly. The, the network, yes. you know? That that mod that mod is long dead. It might still work once in a while, but um, I wouldn't hedge my bets for you, hedging your bets on being that once in a while. You're much better off being the social person who fits into a team well and helps the team grow. So, so it, it it increases your chances of success a lot more. So what would you recommend they do to hone their soft skills? Yes, you're telling them to hone their soft skills, but what exactly do you think, and based on the people you've interviewed, what exactly do you recommend someone can do to improve their soft skills? Step away from your computer. Because, I know it's a hard one. Yeah. Step away I mean, from your computer, Roger. It, it, it's, because soft skills is really talking and interacting with people. And some of those things yes you'll get you can do a lot of that stuff at the computer but some of those you develop when you step away from the computer and you're actually having real conversations with people i think it allows you to develop a, a sense of empathy a sense of uh, wanting to know people a bit more than than um than the the, the emoji they sent um the, the reaction they're sending on slack it, it doesn't hurt after a stand up to check in on someone. It doesn't hurt. It, it's, really, it's really a thing of going beyond um, um, a target worker. I'm here to deliver A, B, C, D, E, and then I'm out. It's I think it's more a thing of just leaning in and listening to people more and being, being a more available person. I don't know if that makes sense. A more mm. empathetic empathetic person mm -hmm. and i feel those are, are, are much better developed when you're actually interacting with people um there are, there are courses out there and all that and those are really nice mm -hmm. but if you're only going to stop at doing that at the computer and not actually stepping out to interact with people i feel it you're, you're going to be very limited Oh, thank you. That, that makes sense. Someone actually asked, what are these soft skills that we keep throwing around? <laughs> <laughs> Is it being able to laugh with your 32 out or? No. I, I, can, I, can, I can put it simply. Because I'll put it in a way that every, every developer can relate with. At least I hope so. You've likely been on a team where there's a rock star person, this guy who knows all his stuff, but there's someone who knows a bit less stuff and you're somehow slightly more comfortable approaching the person who knows a bit less stuff. Like the other rock star, there are some soft skills that they could, they could like. develop, yeah? How they give feedback, like, yeah, it, it's how do they give feedback? How long do they take before they respond to you? How do, they, how do they respond when you ask them a question? Do they first start by, by belittling you and showing you how you should know this? Or how, do they, uh, how do they take criticism when you're doing a PR review? Are you digging in your heels and just trying to show you, guy, this thing actually, I was too good at it. I mean, it's, it's those things, what, what skill, what things about certain team members that you work with, make them preferable team members for you to work with than others. Beyond the code, because it, it, that question actually is rarely answered by the right good mm -hmm. code. Beyond there are a lot of other things that make certain members, you just feel, you just enjoy working with them a bit more than other team members. Those are the soft skills. Oh. Lynn, I hope your question has been answered. <laughs> um, so, so I think right, yes, writing good writing good code are hard skills. 
let's let's say writing good code are hard skills. The rest is soft skills. The rest. Everything else is soft skills. Yeah, no, I think I think it's interesting that you mentioned. So first of all, even looking at your career, you've been an author with the country's leading paper. Um, you you are a telecom engineer. You're a father and husband. <laughs> Hi everyone. But I That's... think that the um, the ability to generalize but also specialize and people are continuously confused do i want to still be writing code at 50 or do i want to advance and become um, vp of technology do i want to manage people code, writing code has become repetitive how do you um how do you address this for people that are at that point in their career mm. That's, that's a really, really, really good question. But it's also a very, very personal question <clears throat> in the sense that where do you want to be? Like really, where do you want to be? Um, the, there's, there's a danger to trying to learn too many things, uh, especially right now. Every, there's, a, there's a new fad every two weeks. Uh, probably shorter, but there's, there's a new language that promising to deliver better, faster, crazier results. And if you just keep jumping on those bandwagons, one, you don't quite learn or master anything, but then two, you, you tire really quickly. And um, so there's, the, there's that aspect of do I specialize, like as you've said, or do I try to be a jack of all trades? The way I look at it is one, you start by deciding what you want to be. Personally, I see, I see myself continuing on the path of tech entrepreneurship. Um, Until you are 70? I, yes. Wow. Yes. <laughs> That's good. Yes. By then, we shall be having different languages. So, hope you'll yeah, be able to satisfy <laughs> you. I think like, tech is going to keep evolving. And my That's role, yes, tech will keep it. evolving. And I'll be investing in, in young startups. I'll be mentoring. I'll be teaching. I'll be training. Ah. But all that is part of entrepreneurship, yeah? Cool. Cool. But I'll also be writing code, because you guys, I love code. Like, I truly, <laughs> truly, 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 truly love code. Like poetry. I, I, I'm sure at some point you ask your wife to give you a plate of code to eat. <laughs> By mistake. Oh, pass a plate of code, please. <laughs> so I, that, I haven't done that one yet, but, <laughs> but I might try it. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I, I know that as, as I get older, I'll have less and less time to write code because um, my responsibilities outside code will increase, but I'll still want to write code. I'll still find time to carve out every so often, once in a while to write a tool just for my personal pleasure. The same way you might still find time to uh, read a book for you who like books. Um, that's the way I see it. So I would say start with where do you want to be? Do you want to be a data scientist? Do you want to go down the path of, um, I don't know, where, where, where do you see yourself? And then based on that, start trying to pursue projects. Again, I, I think this thing is all about projects. Um, I saw one of the questions that came up about which language should you, should you specialize in? And, Again, if 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 you're not if you don't have a project that you're doing that language in, it's not a language you've learned yet. If you've read the Hello World and gone through uh, the tutorials, if you've not delivered the project in it, you haven't yet learned that language. Um, unless you're getting into competitive programming, which is a different beast altogether. Uh, um, but languages are like tools. You are a software engineer, or if you prefer being called a software developer. And every one of them has their nuances, has places where they perform better, has things where you might want to use this over that. So the thing is start with one and gain mastery. Start with the one you're being paid to work with and go deep with it because you have the privilege, the honor of learning while doing. Just go over and extra and learn about a lot more about it. If you're being paid to do JavaScript, Go deep, learn about the event loop, learn about all that other stuff that doesn't seem to matter because what you're doing is you're learning the, the foundational aspects 
of languages, you're learning about OOP and how it works and encapsulation and solid principles and all those nice things in the language you're being paid to code in. And if opportunity arises to be paid to switch and do work in another language, then do that, switch. Because if you've learned once well enough, I can guarantee you, you will pick up another one very quickly. If you learn the foundational aspects of one well enough. Um, in my entire, almost my entire career in MTN, I was working in PHP. And it's a language that is looked down on so, so much, but it delivered value. We were was building stuff for huge, huge things in that language. And when I left that, because I had worked with it long enough and I knew stuff, and I switched to a role uh, in Andela where I now needed to pick up another language, I didn't struggle because I knew the foundational aspects. Foundation. But again, it, it wouldn't have helped me much. And I did this. I, I read about Ruby. I tried a, a lot of different things in it. I read about Python and JS and tried different things in it. But it's when I was now working with these languages full time and being paid to do that stuff that I can actually start putting that thing on my CV that I know that language. Before that, I would just, it, it, it's not a language you, you know yet. So I can now say I know those languages, but it's because I was paid and working in them day and night for extended periods of time. And even for them, I have varying levels of proficiency in them. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you invented a new language tomorrow, I can guarantee you I'll learn it. If you are paying me to learn Wait. it and I wanted to do that you. project. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're paying me to, yes, and you pay me to do that project. Mm -hmm. So the thing is then, what that means is you then start to guide your, start with your end in mind. Again, for me, as I mentioned, my end is tech entrepreneur. So for me, it works that I want to be exposed to these different technologies. I want to be exposed to uh, not just even the languages, to the server and the architecture and DevOps and all that stuff. Like I pick up bits and pieces as I go along. I do the extra mile. I might not necessarily be on this team, but I'll reach out and learn their stuff and be involved in that stuff and learn it. Because my big picture is I have a good end-to-end -end picture of how everything works so that when I'm leading uh, a tech entity or giving advice to a tech entity, I can give advice from an informed point of view. So in the absence of paid work on something, then take oh. on an open source project. Get time outside your work schedule and actually code and deliver stuff in an open source project in a language you want to build on. Either that or build a personal pet project in that language you want to deliver in. Build your personal website, put up your portfolio site. Um, again, it needs, it, you need to actually build something with that thing in that language you want to build in. And let it be targeted towards oh. where you want to go, not just, I, I want to know Java or I want to know Python. Why? Where, where are you going? What's the end in mind? If you want to be a data scientist, then yes. Pick up that Python, but pick it up by actually doing sure. a real, real, real project that you're either being paid, that is open source, or that is a personal thing scratching on each that you're actually going to use and put out there. Cool. Viola, I can see we have a good student of Franklin Covey, who's yeah. giving us the second habit of beginning and end in mind. mind. <laughs> very, 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 very good things. All right, continue, Viola. Sorry, <laughs> interrupt. I think I think before I mean we've 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 pretty much exhausted, but I wanted us to him to answer a few questions that came in from the audience, and the first one um, came in from Asimwe Arnold, and he said, "Could you please talk about API monetization?" It it it's down to which API. Like as a model, it works, but what API are you monetizing? Like what, what data are you exposing? Because it's not about the API per se. The API is, 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 is if two years down the road, we stopped using APIs and we started using, I don't know what. It's not about the API. It's about what are you exposing? That's actually what's valuable, not the API per se. In, in the, yeah, so. You, you can, you can, someone exposing, uh, an, an API exposing uh, mean data 
uh, sorry, national ID information, uh, just to keep this generic. Oh, eh? You are being a Ugandan, yes? <laughs> Someone exposing national ID information via an API is different uh, from someone exposing uh, traffic, statistics on traffic. Um, so both are, both are in API monetization, but the value of the data they're exposing is different and therefore as a business model, it will attract different uh, customers and definitely uh, be priced differently. So it's not about the API, uh, it's about what you're exposing. Maybe I'll just point out one other thing. Another thing I learned it took me quite a while, uh, and it's one of the things I'm still learning is, as technology people, as engineers, our default is to, to focus on the solution and sometimes how cool the solution is. But if there is no customer for that mm -hmm. solution, someone willing to pay for that solution, useless. then it's useless. In, well, it's use, useful to you, but only to yep. make you happy. <laughs> it won't make you money. So if you wanted to become happy, <laughs> Then you're happy, but if you wanted to make money, then it, it won't quite do what you wanted to do. That, that's that's the thing. So API monitoring is the technology, but it's about the customer, and the customer it's down to what value is it delivering to them. All right, cool. and I think you you mentioned very uh, that people have to think what the big picture is. I see there's someone who understands your PHP pain. Uh, he says that PHP had a uh, chokehold on the Ugandan tech space 10 years ago. So don't worry, the IOP has on the score. Um, I had seen another question from Martin Karajaya. Um, uh, how do you, uh, it was about specialization, I think you addressed it, but he said, how do you specialize in one language when most of the current roles require, you know, multiple technologies? That's a good question because that's, that's also not necessarily true. What I've learned is <clears throat> the, the, the difference in specialization is down to many times the maturity of the place you're going to be working with. If you're working with a, a typical startup, um, startups tend to favor startup and mid-level companies tend to, to favor working with uh, generalists because yeah, you, you're, you're building something. You don't have that level of specialization on your team to have some people doing data science and then AI and then DevOps. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, it's not typical. Yeah, uh, but, so, I, but sorry to interrupt you, but I guess this is because due to budget constraints, that's why exactly. most startups do like that. Exactly, right. exactly. Right. It's right. exactly because of that. It's exactly a budgetary constraint. It's pragmatic. It makes sense. You don't have the budget to do that. So you get people and they come in with their one skill and grow and pick on these other skills, which I think is a really, really, really good place for someone to start, because then you get an idea of how all these other things work. You might not necessarily be an expert at any, any of those things per se. You, you will have mastery in one aspect. And if you need to dive deep in another, you pick a certain level of, of depth for it as and when you need. So I, I, I love that space. I love people start, starting out in that space. As again, depending on where you want to go, if your goal is to get into Google, Facebook, I mean, those are places where now specialization comes in. You're not going to uh, assume that you're going to be a software engineer and you're, all, you're, you're, you're also doing stuff in, the, in data science. Like the much bigger, a lot more mature entities now have specialization where you have DevOps, you have um, a data scientists who even studied that stuff. Like Security. they have the master that stuff. Yes. So that level of specialization comes in for the much more mature company. So if your end goal, which is why I'm throwing this out, it's again, what is your end goal? And th there's nothing wrong with what your end goal is. Yours doesn't have to be mine. There's none that's right or that's wrong. It's what do you want to be? You, you, you're in such a privileged position that uh, the world is your oyster, really. You, you choose and then apply yourself and grow in that area and then choose to go down that path if that's what you want to do. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if, if I've captured all aspects of that. 
Uh, you definitely have. Oh, interesting. All right, I think this could be the last question. Uh, it's a bit personal, not per not so personal. Uh, for me, when I was when I was growing, don't laugh, don't laugh, don't laugh. <laughs> All right, when I was growing up, like ten years ago, and I was still in secondary. Viola, do not laugh at me. Uh, and my father used to tell me that um, if others can do it, so can you. And I want to turn this to you and uh, for you to help us share uh, some one thing you wish you were told uh, when you were starting out your career back then. And have you actually found, uh, have you, uh, what, what you can actually find helpful in the tech industry? That thing you were told way back that you can actually use now, um, we'd have loved to hear right now. Ah, that's a big one. Um, I think it would have, it would have helped to tell me back then that really the main, it, it sounds cliche, but it really sounds something like a dad would say really, right. <laughs> that the limits are the ones you place on yourself. I, I said this because starting out, one of the areas I, I started and stopped and started and stopped in was in uh, growing in algorithms and data structures. Like it's stuff that I tried and I was like, this stuff is too hard. It, it takes some really smart stuff, smart chaps who've gone to Harvard. <laughs> Let me first chill with stuff. Go back to your normal nice coding and you'll be nice happy. Coding. Like I kept starting and stopping that. For, for quite a while. It, it would have helped to know that, I mean, this is a field um, that is, especially today, there's so much in terms of resourcing. There's so much in terms of material out there. It's down to deciding this is what I would like to be. This is where I'd want to be. Uh, and then pacing yourself. Because uh, the other aspect is that sometimes you assume that those people who are good at this stuff um, got there in, in three months. And so when in three months you're still struggling with big O notation, you're like, I'm not smart enough. Yet, man, those guys had the background of first of all studying that stuff in school. You, you, oh, did, yeah. you, you did statistics, the other guy did computer <laughs> science. Computer. <laughs> big huh? external. Yes, yes, yes. You won't become external. So, <laughs> so first, <laughs> I mean, give extend uh, extend grace to yourself and and keep applying yourself. Keep chipping away at that thing bit by bit, and you'll get there. I I feel that advice also speaks to the journey I've gone through building a business. It's one I I um I didn't know I didn't have the skills for. Um, I I thought the tech you should be able to hack it in the tech field since you know how to code. But it would have helped to know back then that this is now a new skill set you're stepping into and you're going to need some time to develop the skills that you need, you need to be better at, at, uh, at, at navigating this particular field. So it's that, that you can actually grow and uh, the limits are only the ones you place on yourself. And uh, if you just find the right uh, mentors, the right material, and then test yourself, yeah. You can you can you can rock this thing this thing called life. Perfect. Thank I you. I think uh, on your already long bio, we should add a motivational speaker. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's because of the church, the church bit of it. That's why he's good at it. Wait, brother, if you're not ready to get baptized, don't mention any church thing. <laughs> I um, you see, I, I know what makes project keep quiet, but um, I think overall, Peter, it's, it's, it's been a very delightful discussion, um, borrowing from your experience, cutting across entrepreneurship, technology, and just for you sharing what the journey has been. So, Sedge from the old man who has no gray hair, <laughs> Peter Kakoma, <laughs> uh, it's definitely been an honor. Thank you for sharing. And for the people that managed to join in, we hope um, you had something to learn or the questions that you had were, were answered. Um, 
Until next time, of course, I remain Viola, your co-host.